to the Kin and Decoded show. I feel very excited about it, no matter like how long we're going to be able to talk until the rain pours on you. But I think there is some sort of momentum happening right now in, in different areas that prompt more in-depth um, conversations. Not that they haven't had happened before, but I think there is there is more interest in really digging deeper into some definitions that we've been using for so long and questioning some of the the assumptions that we have made for so long, not by individuals, but by bigger cohorts and groups and um, some individuals as well. In terms of dark training, what's the best way to do so? Right. You don't really need an introduction and all my listeners will know who you are and um, everyone who follows you obviously knows who you are. But I still want to know a number. How long have you been in dog training or handling dogs? How many years? Yeah. So so I I try not to think of it, um, although it seems like it's yesterday, but really um, I would say, you know how everybody starts with dogs as soon as they can right. have a dog and so on but I, I i would say like really my when i decided that that's my path like that that once i decided that i'm good at it i have the talent and i really like it it, it was um mid 80s okay so, so 40 so years long time yeah. And um, in that context, and it doesn't have to be, well, whatever you think is relevant, like for you personally, maybe emotionally in that context, what in those 40 years, having worked with so many dogs, having seen so many changes or um, developments in the dog training world, what do you consider personally your biggest accomplishment? And it doesn't have to be anything like you know world championships, or, but something that yeah. you feel like this is this is what you have contributed. Yeah. Um, well, uh, the so the the winning world championships is definitely uh, it, it just kind of reconfirms to myself that I'm not just blowing smoke in right. you know, like like because from from early on I was like, man, I'm really good at this. I I can. You know, I always had a little different take on how everybody thinks, and I, I always come up with something a little different. And so that really validated a lot of things. And and it was a goal that's not easy to accomplish, of course. It's not a... So I, I was chasing this for a long time as an accomplishment. Um, so this is definitely a big, big deal for me. Um, but... I think I have uh, quite a few different contributions. So, yeah, this is an interesting question. You got me thinking right away, deep. Well, what is, yeah, um, I mean, I don't want to... I would say, to you know, I would say play is something that um, the way I look at play um, and how how it affects dog training and what can be done in yeah. dog training. I think that's a very... Um, uh, very, very different uh, approach and take on, on, of course, everybody playing, everybody's, you know, um, it's just very different what I do and, and how I work through that. So uh, play is for sure a big deal. Um, at the time when, you know, I wrote a book mid 90s and, and basically um, there was a lot about at that time how to well, first of all, to understand what you can do, what negative punishment is, what you can do with it, and and when it can fail. Um, so that that was a you know another thing. Of course, using using signals and markers, which was already that that on its own was a new, but where I was applying at that, that at the time was a very very different um now it's very common thing so i would say that i mean definitely winning the championship is a it's yeah. a huge huge thing yes. and 
the other thing would be play. Um, and if... So in the in, in the context of play and, and you know using obviously these these moments of of um, understanding the dog in front of you and moving towards a goal together. What is it that you understand about dogs that you feel like most people don't? And by most people, I don't necessarily mean people who, you know, go through years of like really honing their skill, but like on the, on the average, you know, so many people have dogs and just hang out with their dogs at pet dogs. What do you personally, you think you understand about dogs that most people don't understand or not mm. understand, but don't know yeah. about? Yeah. Um, or maybe it's yeah. just an intuition. No, it's a, it's a very interesting question. And, and there is like, uh, it's something that I have been it's been in my head for years, like not yeah. 10, not 15, not 20 years. It's just been something that like I know, and it's not just me, like anybody that has trained with me, anybody that has been around me to, to where they can have even half an hour of me talking and thinking dogs will very quickly realize that, that there is uh, something I see it yeah, um, very different, but I would say very logically to where when I say what I see and why we will take certain approach, then it's just so uh, so obvious that it's almost mm -hmm. like people actually hate that, that they couldn't <laughs> just come up with it. And, and yeah. that happens like literally all, almost every time I work with people that don't know me. Um, so is it, is it some sort of like abstraction? Because we, and we'll all talk about this a little more, but we are so yeah. kind of caught up in our own human perspectives that it takes some sort of skill to pull out and see things that most yeah. people don't. But then when you know it, then you know it, then you see it. Yeah. And again, like I know some people that really, the only people that don't know me will will laugh at what I'm just about to say, but um, I'm extremely good at explaining to a dog what to do in a, most often in a very radically different way than what anybody else will do. That's really, uh, um, like anybody that has worked with me can, it's like, yeah, that's Ivan. There is no question. Yeah. I, and again, it's to the point that I, I, I would sometimes be like, well, what, how am I coming up with this? And there is 20 people here that have been doing dogs just as long as me. And why is it that only I see it from that angle? And it, it's very puzzling to me. Um, <laughs> it, it really is. And at the same time, you know, um, I'm I'm very confident in what I do, uh, and and often people will say, "Well, yeah, you've been doing it for a very long time, and you have the experience. Um, experience you cannot. Experience matters, of course. Um, but I personally um, think that it's just a you know I don't know for a lack of better word that there is some talent, there is some intuitive uh, yeah. again." thinking in a very different way although very simplistic way and probably um one of the things again like i've been thinking about this for for years and mm -hmm. i i understand something how dogs function and the and and the differences between us and the dogs um you know like dogs cannot think abstract they cannot be instructed as a how you would instruct a kid or a grown-up person it's like well if you do that then you will get that or if you then we're gonna take your playstation but but having said that i feel very comfortable finding ways how to do just that with a dog without mm -hmm. we still with them there's i mean not it's not like some magic uh, like i i totally get that there are limitation and there is just really you cannot I mean, that's why we're humans and, and we are the only things, at right. least as we know on planet Earth, that we can do this kind of thinking. Um, but yeah. I didn't, I didn't want this to be too complicated, but I think what you said was really powerful that you have a way of explaining something to a dog. Um, because explaining kind of sounds really simple when you speak the same language, but it becomes a whole different story if you 
don't speak the same language, you're not the same species, and you don't even have the same capacity of conceptualizing the world around you. And it's on the one who has maybe the higher capacity of doing so to bring it to a level that the other species understands. And I think in today's society, we assume a lot more than we actually can do with dogs and that they're not capable. They just need different ways. So I think that's that's a really good right. statement in finding a way to explain it, which is also very, very different. I'm just going to help. Some might say, well, you just force a dog. It's not the same as explaining to a dog so that the dog is you know, willing right. to cooperate no, no, and be the team you, in you're that just sense. saying it way better than so what I, really I like try it. to do. <laughs> Again, like I, I probably will never have that answer even for myself and it's a, <laughs> i'll ask you um, again in a couple of years the good thing is that again it's like i i just feel very very comfortable and confident of of what i do and i'm saying uh, there's times of course everybody has to do something a little bit and, and as long as you understand that it's going off the rail and you can reset it without right damaging anything without even allowing the dog to even feel it that way you know so there is for sure uh, uh, a lot of even if you want to call it you know testing waters and experimenting but we we very kind of doing it very intelligently so as i say um there is always a a reset moment if needed when you say um without damaging anything i think that's a it's a Good segue into some something that I first want to say congratulations. The paper that has been published with your contribution you. to setting up um, these experiments, and I am sure it probably took some time. Me as like having spent in academia, I know a lot of things can take a lot of time, and I want to just talk a little bit about it um, because I think there are some really good talking points that are being addressed just even in the title mm -hmm. it's comparison of the efficacy and welfare so that i can just stop already there so we're talking about the the efficacy of training and the welfare of dogs and these are two big statements that have always been talked at as mutually exclusive or one cannot be you know including the other so from your perspective and being involved in that study, how do you see these terms, efficacy of dog training methods, welfare of dogs, um, and what is the relationship with one? Yeah, like, like I have three big things that really are, are critical. And, and if one is a little off, then, then uh, um, most likely it will not be an optimal result. And that's the efficacy, ethical treatment, welfare. And the other one is timely fashion, timely manner, how long it will take. Because, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and for me, they're not in any particular order. Like I, I put how long it will take just as important as being or not being effective or being or not being ethical. Mm -hmm. Because if, if, I mean, if, if you think of any kind of, somewhat dangerous problem that the dog's having maybe danger to to itself or to others time is of essence at, at, at any point and and you know sometimes you're just letting a dog staying in that kind of space in their mind for for longer than they should that that's to me not not a cool thing to do i mean the study just came out so I, i'm sure that half of the internet is extremely happy and the other half is wants to just destroy and burn the computers probably they i, I understand that a lot of people got taken by surprise especially on the the forestry side of things that there is finally a study that says otherwise and it's going to take a little time to, to sink in. Um, what is different is that I am open to talk about the study. Like you can ask me anything and I'm open to talk about it. To where I've been trying to talk to anyone that has been 
in some way part of any of the study that was done in the early 2000s to all the way to uh, Daniel Mills as to, you know, basically a- every study that wanted, that said that aversives are a bad idea, no matter what. And it's proven and there is evidence. I tried to talk to every single one of them. Um, I've gotten very close to talk to somebody publicly and then they would back away. You, I, I'm glad you're noticing the title because a lot of people are trying to kind of take away what, again, it's just uh, emotions running wild at this time. It's just been oh, yeah. one day that the thing is out. So so it's like a, a tsunami, really. Like I didn't want to turn it into competition, which one is better. Like we can do that. That's okay to do. What was more important for me is to demonstrate that we can use electric color and there will be no fallouts as described in every single study. And the thing, the way they describe it, and I know you kind of lately started to dig into them too, and I've been doing this for like since 2001 until the very first one. One study comes out and then it gets cited and then there is a survey and then that gets cited, then gets referenced, and all of a sudden they become more and more legit with every year time goes by. And it becomes really, this is, this is what it is. While a lot of people don't see those fallouts in everyday training, there is trainers out and about that do every day spend literally hours at a time training dogs. And you can compare a a brilliant study that has, let's say, 20 dogs, 50 dogs, 100 dogs, and you have short and long-term follow-up. It still cannot compare to somebody training dogs for 30 years and not seeing what the study says and not having that conversation why that's the case. That's what's really bothering me. So when we did the study, my main objective really was, let's find out what really happens when a dog starts to chase something, it gets tapped on a collar twice or five times, what happens next? You know, whatever the study would have shown, I'm totally fine because that's the whole point of it. If, If it was ineffective or it was unethical or any of the things, you know, we talk about it and then we move on, we, we advance. But the fact is that every single dog had no fallout besides the very initial interaction with the electric collar uh, to stop them from the chasing. That was it. For the rest of the days, there was nothing. To the, for the and, rest and of the have, Did you say this for the rest of the, the days of the study? Okay. And, uh, you know, to just throughout the study. And I mean, we have videos, like I, I have filmed the whole thing myself, like every single second of it. And if I show you videos of the dogs, you will be like, there is really no need for tickle test or cortisol or, or anything because it's, it, it's just laughable. You, you see dogs, playful dogs, that that's what you see. If anything, they are put in this area and now they know that they're not going to chase the lure. So they're done with that. And yeah. every time they come inside, they're like, okay, so what the fuck, what, what are we doing? Like, what should we do now? Yeah. And they get bored. So you would see a dog jumping off the fence, going out, grabbing a stick, coming in and shoving it and just making you play. You see a dog like... I mean, I mean yeah. just entertaining themselves in the most ridiculous way just because yeah. they cannot understand why are we here and why yeah. are we just, everybody's ignoring us and like, <laughs> what, what, what are we supposed to do? You know, it's just so funny. Yeah. And well, go ahead. Let me, let me interrupt you for a second here, because I think um, the fallouts, the pain, the fear that is being so feared by, by people I definitely want to dig more into this, but first. Something that I have picked up from initial reactions 
uh, from that paper. Um, and I want to just, you know, clarify the intention here because maybe you can describe more what the lure was for the dog to mm -hmm. trigger chasing. What actually about this lure? Because one of the feedbacks is, well, it's not the same as having a live animal. And the question mm -hmm. is, is it really not, or is it just a matter of the intensity or commitment, but still the same predatory sequence that is being activated by right. movement potentially? So what is the, in terms of the technical setup, and I'm sure you, you help plan that, what was the lure? What were you trying to activate? And more importantly, what I found very interesting is you didn't, in the control groups, you didn't just stop the lure right as soon as there was contact, but you continued doing it to not have some sort of effect on the, the movement is gone. Mm -hmm. and now we're kind of creating some artificial avoidance to that that we didn't intend to do in the first place as a control. So just to make sure that we on the same page, what is the lure exactly? What is it activating? And can it can be compare it to real life scenarios where a dog chases a squirrel, a bunny, or runs across the street or chases a car. Yeah. Um, so the, the lore is, it's actually quite standard. Like you will see those, like it's a little string that runs around on a little motor with a little plastic, kind of like a plastic bag. And you can change direction. You can make it go faster. You can do a lot of things and it goes pretty fast. And I know that, you know, I mean, there, there is no question about doing something, chasing a lure and convincing a dog not to chase the lure. That's not going to, on its own, translate with most dogs to, I'm not going to chase a squirrel. But we selected dogs that are instinctively, like they just cannot help themselves, just mm. very, very extremely hardwired to where mm. they cannot respond in any other way to any movement mm. than to just go all in. And that particular instinct, whatever name we want to call it, it is the same as when they get convinced to, to go after a prey. Mm -hmm. What the the study the again like if you man there's so many things to talk about and i'm getting like like they're coming just so many at the same time so when you we we selected and, and that was another like there's just so many like laughable things but people just very quickly don't read and and i guess it can be explained anyway so the dogs in the groups they got selected like computers select them. It's not like we pick off oh, this dog, this dog. But what we did as a group together, we made sure that every single dog is as close as possible, equally insanely crazy to chase. And any dog that chased for uh, during the testing periods for a minute, but you see them kind of hopping like little butterflies. Oh yeah, I'm going, I'm having a good time. It, it, this is not that when, you know, you your heartbeat starts to skip a bit and your blood pressure goes up and your eyes are like this and, and somebody's poking you and you are not responding. That's Those are the kind of dogs that we selected. And, and only those dogs got in. Uh, from there on, it was a, you know, a computer program that said, okay, these are the three groups. These are the names of this and this. They're just totally random. And the, uh, the idea of the study is what does it take to stop a dog when they're in this mindset? That was just the, the main objective. It wasn't how does that translate to the dog being in open space and chasing sheep or... When when the mindset is similar, we know that we can we can uh, uh, either accomplish it or no if it worked in in that setting. And and again, just because we were able to stop them to not to chase the plastic bag, that doesn't mean that they will not chase something else. But what it means is that we can create the same association with anything they want to chase and convince them not to. 
in a in a very safe way. And when we talk about like I learned so much about studies and and again like I've been reading studies for so long now and it took me a long time to even learn how to read studies and what questions to ask. But but doing it it, it was a uh, it's just like kinda like writing a book. All of a sudden you yeah. it's a it's a very special experience. And mm-hmm. with watching the dogs that uh, um you know the the positive reinforcement dogs chasing and you know not being able to catch it because you you really you can play with them games to where you can just really like a cat with a cat toy it's not that it's one direction and they can just kind of stalk it and grab it it's like no then you're gonna go the other way i mean you really drive them crazy and they cannot stop and then you you see a, a you know very uh, frustrated animal that the cortisol levels on on the first three dogs were way higher than the than the electric collar group simply because the electric collar dogs were just rolling on the grass and and doing kind of stupid things while the other ones were exhausting themselves in chasing and barking and frustration so you know like they they're clearly so upset and frustrated that they're stressed out because of that right. um so there there was things like this that were you know very very interesting and then when you think of cost and benefit um this is always the the somehow the the force free community at least uh, i i wouldn't think it's all of them but but the the people that are in this really extreme levels if you cannot stop a dog from chasing a car and your answer is well why would you let the dog on off leash these are the conversations that get very interesting and and there is probably like we all get stuck in a loop and we cannot get out of it because i want my dog to be able to be free uh, i i believe in in being free i i coming from a communist country myself and I grew up in a place where freedom it's not Give. something that it's, it's just you don't have and having a dog that every once in a while you can pick some space to where they can be free but most of the time they're on a long leash and and sure you have all this and buttons and that that's just not what a dog would like to do if they have a choice like you can leave them with the game and you can leave them a free space and they will run and they will dig holes and they will chase squirrels and they will be dogs i think this is uh one of the kind of difficult conversations that just doesn't seem to and difficult because we absolutely disagree on yeah why 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 do you want to have these three dogs run together and that's why the one has the electric color because you can tell them to tone it down a little bit if needed but other than that they have the freedom to do anything they want to do as a group of dogs the, what you said is is interesting to think about for everyone is let's just say there is a pocket of redirection into what you call the sniffing games and little games here and there just to not have the dog focus on something that we don't want them to focus on which could be the the squirrel the the car driving by but then the next question is if they had a choice because you still have to put in some effort into getting the dog pay attention to the alternative let's just say sniffing games if they had a choice would they still prefer that over doing anything else that is now being eliminated because with the reinforcement of one particular behavior, you don't, you also eliminate all other choices. Right. And what comes to mind is an argument I hear a lot with zoo animals, where it is being argued that we've shown in zoo animals many times that positive reinforcement works. And I have read a lot of studies on the actual perception of that training by zoo animals animals in terms of it's not so much about the reward they're getting but having no choice 
right. but doing it for the resource because otherwise they wouldn't get any food. And right. I think that's something we need to consider in terms of what do, because we're all about welfare of dogs and giving them, hey, we're assuming this is what you prefer as a dog, but is it really? And yeah. not giving a choice otherwise is something yeah. we don't think about a lot. I I agree 100% with what you're saying. And it, it, it is pointed out always when in, in any kind of, not in direct conversations, because we don't have direct conversations, but it's always pointed out that, well, if you can convince an elephant to draw blood, what about a dog? It's like, right. I, I'm not interested in drawing blood off a leg of an elephant behind this insanely strong metal bars. I would be interested if with you interacting with some wild elephant, like go, go in, I don't yeah. know, India or Thailand or yeah. Africa and, and do something with the inner freedom, you know, come, come yeah. to some level of cooperation and convince them to do something. That, that would be of interest. But having an orca in a bathtub, I, I mean, a, like a highly social animal deprived from, from its own species, deprived from any expansion of, of energy. I mean, it's, it's like you're living in an elevator if you're a human. Like, like, and then you have to perform tricks to get some food on one side i understand okay yes we can do it i mean of course we can do it it's been done and we know and it's been experimented and and yes here is the result but it's way more valuable to have this accomplished with an animal outside now i've had this conversation with some people and they would well we can we can take them on open ocean it's like no it's not about already brainwashed animal going in an open ocean when the open ocean is not home anymore. Right. That is not be beyond the point. But unfortunately, somehow that's how the the that whole movement of the superiority of positive reinforcement over everything else started. Yeah. With marine world. With yeah. the uh, uh, marine world trainers. And not understanding that this is, you know, I mean, I mean, just, just as I, I think you said, no, but you know, you, you're putting the lenses to look at the positive reinforcement and completely refusing to talk about how did you get there? Right. It's yeah. like a two, two sides of the coin and, and deprivation of social activities with its own species, deprivation of just having the freedom to swim in the amount of, of incredible lengths of, of what they choose to eat. Right. And then, and then try to make it well, well, but they, we have enrichment. Look at him playing with the hula hoop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah. I think that's one of those criticism behaviorism we have really set up experiments or set up like training sessions versus ethology where you observe the right. action That's exactly in right. the in the nature where the where the wild animal is supposed to be. Um I think the problem with dogs is because for dogs the wild is our living room. So it's very easy to put constraints around what well, is this the training session. It still doesn't quite fully that captures the picture of we're still controlling very much all the resources and still the dog is being pushed into a kind of sort of environment. You could argue a lot of genetic and instinctual behaviors are not aligned with the constraints you put them there. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, again, like this, this, these are all super interesting things that I, I just cannot stop thinking of. And when, when I talk about play and think of some dogs the way they are raised like we know we know the effects of of you any any kind of deprivation and deprivation from play is not much different than any of the other ones that we already talked about but particularly in an early age you you get a puppy being from the shelter being from a bidder you have a eight week old puppy at home and you 
create these enrichment places and you do suits and downs for food and you play ball. That's not the play that the dog needs to really evolve and develop, even even mentally. Like like in play at that age, like when you ask like, well, what is play good for? Why why are we fucking playing, right? And one of my answers always is because uh, it allows the brain to learn what the body can do and learn how to control it and how to become more efficient and eventually use all those skills in, in various places in life. Yeah. But here is the funny, the interesting part, not funny, but interesting part, particularly, and I, I would argue almost with everybody, including kids, most play that it's of interest has some level of adversity, some level of discomfort. Like any interesting game, any two dogs, when you see two dogs play, and there there can be, I mean, I have puppies right now, I watch them. They will play fight. They're not playing in any other way but play fighting. That includes discomfort. We're not talking some fallouts and some, but but we are seeking discomfort and we're learning how to deal with it and also how to make up after that and how to cooperate, how to, we can continue to go on. Right. When we take that element of discomfort all together from an eight-week-old puppy on, they don't know how to be. That, that's an argument that I, they, they just do not develop the way they should. And then they don't, they, they don't know how to properly react to various situations in life. Right. And on top of that, they end up searching like, uh, like you, I always love these examples. I have, uh, like in my school, I give them often, you will have a dog walking on a sidewalk and uh, just a plastic bag flies by and that dog gets spooked. Like seriously, like what the hell? Tail tucked years back, hackles all the way. It's like, what the hell? But guess what? Most of them don't run away. They get in that safe distance and now they're engaged. They, they cannot just let it be. Now they're going to approach it this way. Now they're going to, well, boom. And that exploration, that, that's just so it needed. Like it just tells you how much they need that fight, if you want to call it, within inside them with adversity. Yeah. And, it's interesting, yeah. and, and another thing about the play is that the eight week old puppy that I was just describing that plays with the enrichment games and maybe ball, it never gets the opportunity to kind of self explore play and control the play. It's always something guided. It's kind of, it's not that different with kids today. Like parents will get the kid from school and take it to the karate gym or the whatever lesson is. And they would think that this is a, a playtime, but the playtime, just like with everything else, it's it, it really it's a freedom for you to choose what to play at this moment with. You're the creator of the game. Like we know, like we're capable of coming up with infinite numbers of, of games. Yeah. And go ahead. Yeah, and I'm just thinking the moment you said that is really what it reminded me of when I grew up. Um, and it seems like a long time ago, but I was, I grew up in East Germany too. So even though mm. they were already unified, it was still very simplistic and very natural in a lot of ways. And what we did as kids is, you know, we didn't have much. So we just went out and it's just, it just sounds like so old, but we just went out into the woods and the game was, let's climb that tree. And right. there's a risk involved. There's probably some adverse experience involved because someone will fall off the tree, but we picked it out of all the possibilities we had in that moment. It wasn't that we were scheduled for a certain right. class of doing some rock climbing of the, on the wall that has all these things already put there because then it becomes a choreography, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly it. Now, another thing. That, that it's always uh, somehow an issue and I just don't get it why. Well, 
I have three dogs and they run off leash and they never need any adversaries. And I'm like, that's so awesome. I mean, good. You're lucky. You're good for you, you know, <laughs> but that's not to say that every dog is like your dog. Mm-hmm. Like it, it is just like, if you think that every person has the same interest, it's like, well, why, why you don't go to a UFC fight and get punched in the face? Cause you don't like it. But there's people that from a little kid, that's their dream to get punched in the face and punch back. Mm-hmm. But some person doesn't, they want to figure skate. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, that there, there is different personalities and, and it, it really becomes like uh, it just stalls a conversation when somebody says, well, my dog never needs that. Or would you do this to a kid? It's like, no, why, why are we talking about doing things to kids even? Like why it's like how this comes to the argument, just like with, well, would you do this? See, if you can do it with an elephant, you should be doing it with a dog. Or right. would you do that to a kid? No, you cannot don't need to do that with a kid because you can clearly tell a kid what to do and what the consequences are. And as we said, we can instruct a kid and it is just brilliant that we are humans and we can do that. Right. Now with toddlers, it's a little different, but, but they are toddlers are for, for a couple of years. It's short lived. You can manage it if you want to. It's up to you. Even as much as I'm not all about reinforcement and punishment and just Skinnerian type of behaviorism. But it blows my mind when we say, well, there is the ABC antecedent behavior consequence. Well, but the consequences are either or. They're not all positive. And differential reinforcement is an amazing thing, but it doesn't necessarily going to uh, uh, work in, in in every situation. I don't know, like we, we have refused to have a conversation and probably we are not ready to have a conversation because we are just continuing to pull the rug hmm. towards our side. Um, well, what I want to talk about is a little bit more in particular because you mentioned emotional state and then a lot of our language that comes with welfare of dogs is observing the dog, seeing what emotional state the dog is in. And I'm going to put my science head on because what I always found interesting is how do you know, how do you really know how a dog feels? And I'm not talking about the behavior in terms of approach or avoidance, but Mm -hmm. feelings that we, I think, assume way more than what the dogs actually do, because there's a difference between between fear as a behavior in terms of avoidance and feeling scared. And I think we often say they are scared when we talk about fear, but I don't think that's true. And say that I would, again. I, I think there is a difference between when we talk about fear as a behavior in terms of avoidance mm-hmm. versus being scared that we okay. feel as humans. And yeah. I think a lot of times when we say welfare, <clears throat> you know, it induces fear. We're talking about the dog being scared of the world, which I don't think is true. But I would like to hear your definition of fear. But first, I want to give you like some context that I thought is very interesting and you might find interesting too, unless you maybe you have heard of it already. Because it all kind of emotions and, and feelings in dogs is a very contentious topic. And... It all kind of goes back to Darwin, who um, obviously we know his works, but he also published something on the emotion in animals in 1872. So very long time ago, but Mm -hmm. he was very vocal about it. And he assumed that we have inherited our emotion. We humans have inherited the ability to feel and have emotions from animals. So the consequence was animals feel the same way as we do. And that yeah. kind of shifted the assumption from emotions being very subjective to emotions being a response to stimuli from the environment. And um, there's a very, very, very vocal researcher on the neuroscience of fear and anxiety in animals, Joseph Ledoux. 
I don't know if I pronounce it correctly. I, I, yeah, I, I know. I, you know I, yeah. I, yeah, of course. Work New York University, and he has created um, like a two-system model. And basically what he is saying is when we see fear as a behavior, it doesn't necessarily mean the animal feels the fear right. that we think the animal does. Right. And um, all of the older studies in particular that do not look or couldn't look at physiological markers of stress, like cortisol, go by, and this is a new study too, or the study from um, that, that you work with um, these researchers, go by ethograms or like behaviors that we see. And we always assume the dog pins the ears back, maybe hovers over the ground a little more, tucks the tail, and the dog is super scared. Versus fearful and a pro like being careful in what to do. And then the next question is, well, if the dog knows exactly how to avoid, is there even fear in the first place? So a long story short, with that context, what is your understanding of fear in dogs? Do we misinterpret things? Do we put more emotions from ourselves onto it? And is that really, because all the, all the conversations are around fallouts and punishment induces fear. Yeah. Can we even say that's true? Yeah. I'm still trying, like, it, it's been a while since I read his stuff. I remember him even going, talking about how even the word fear in different languages. Yeah, 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 when, yeah. When you, you know, exactly. how, how different cultures will, like, I am trying to kind of retrieve as much as yeah. I can as you're talking. Um, but yeah, I mean, fear is a, gosh, I mean, how can you argue without fear? And, and I think... Um, I don't know. As as you were talking, there there is also you know um, the that kind of outdated model of fight flight response, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. The what was the lizard brain that what do you call it that tutor curing something? I can't remember now. But anyway, the like we know now that the we have we have that they are not like this separate like right. literally separate compartments in a brain right it, it's it's a united action that the brain tries to predict what the hell we're going to do right now and using uh, everything that they, it should uh, according to the situation and and respond properly and fear is a it's so important it's it, it basically what it means is take take this moment a little more serious than you would typically do with something else. Don't don't be so relaxed and casual. Pay attention. That that's one really cool benefit of fear. Mm -hmm. It doesn't get you in trouble. It saves you. You're like you're like we all are alive because we are not fearless. Right. right. Um and overcoming your fear like like when you when you think of you know like sensation seeking like you, it's all like thrill like if you're that kind of person that you if you do a test and you're like no i, I want to do crazy stuff and like you're out of your mind why it's not because you're not afraid it's because actually because you are afraid mm -hmm. and that is what drives you to do these things in a mm -hmm. manageable way to where you grow from it or another insanely big one manage your depression or PTSD or, or basically put the brain give the brain something more important at the moment than dwelling on I broke up with my girlfriend and is she gonna call me now and when you put yourself in this situation like even when you think uh, uh, you know fear or, or any kind of discomfort can do that and when you when you're skillful how to to do it reasonably it, it's uh, insanely valuable I mean when you think of like even you know like Wim Hof style cold plunges and, and you know things like that it, it, like your neuroscientists, you know, you, your brain cannot 
contradict at the same time. Like I'm happy and I'm depressed or right. I am like, like their priorities and the priorities immediately override. And it's like, okay, right now I'm going to get whatever I need energy source from the body and I'm going to put it here. And this is our priority as a being, right? And, and this is where I think fear is, is just so uh, um, misunderstood in the dog world as, as something horrible. Because um, thinking of protection sport dogs, of course, we select them. They're thrill seekers. You know, they're not like you cannot tell a dog that doesn't want to do protection to send him 50 meters away to go and bite somebody. They're like a humor out of your mind. And it's, there is no force that you can do to make that happen. And even if you somehow come up with it, the moment there's a choice, they're not doing this. But then you have the dog that's already 16 years old and it's crippled and barely hear, barely can see. You have to kind of bump them with the sleeve and they're like, oh my God, there's this thing again. And their heart skips a beat. Yeah. But one reason why they're so addicted to it, there is an element of fear of challenge and how do we interact with discomfort in a, in a uh, productive, in a good way, mm-hmm. you know? Like so I don't know if I'm answering, Lily. I, I think I went off on something else, but... Um... No, no, I think it makes sense, though. It's more, you mentioned multiple elements of it um, in terms of what fear really is. It's a good thing. It's not, well, let's say a different thing. It's not a bad thing. It's a very baked into our biology and everyone's biology. But often this being also you mis- misinterpreted as um, Pangsep's kind of definition, animal fear, like you know, rage and fear and whatnot, lust. Um, he was really talking about primitive states. He wasn't talking about the all the complex feelings that we have in mm-hmm. animals. And overcoming fear you know when we talk about fear people then talk about the amygdala they talk about fight or flight fight or flight was never meant to be this what you said as we understand it it was meant to be as a description of the stress response and the behaviors or options you have in moments you feel pressured in any shape or form um and overcoming that part of it is the the essence of progressing in terms of growth and we know right. that in humans, but even in human society, we're living in a world where we all kind of preach, be calm, meditate, avoid all kind of stress. And we kind of, you know, instill that into our dog's life too. And we created right. some really dangerous and really uncomfortable environments for our dogs where they're not allowed to be faced with fear. They're not allowed to overcome them. And they're not allowed to even feel any negativity in their lives. And that creates some really weak mm-hmm. mindsets. Uh, all positive trainer thinks of fear. They are implying this constant state mm-hmm. of at any moment, something is about, something really bad is about to happen to me. Right. That, that's like, why do we need to think of these extremes all the time as a, as a, like, yeah, which is anxiety. There is just nothing to come out of that. What I what I've been saying many times to go from a moment of fear and overcoming to what we fear, the, what we don't want our dogs to experience, this constant state of fear, which is right. the situation of anxiety. It's not a feature of fear itself. It's a feature of the lack of understanding what's happening, and that's. Right. A, story in the context of training communicating with the dog and probably one of the biggest issues we have is comparing contingent and non-contingent of anything Mm -hmm. i mean pretty much this is like the, the the if we don't talk about specific things but we say what what really the conflict is why we are not understanding each other is because you're bringing a point where Okay, what happens? And the dog has no idea why. 
And I'm like, well, what happens when the dog actually knows, right? And he has a choice to do or not, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and when you think of the, some of the studies that they did back 10, 15 years ago, there was a lot of the stuff was non-contingent. Like the dogs, the group of dogs that things made sense, they had a short-lived, unpleasant moment. And they were fine. The dogs that were really shaken is the dogs that have no clue why and when it's going to happen. It's like you're going in your house and, and it's booby trapped and you are just not want to go inside your house because you just don't know what's going to hit you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Versus knowing that there is a bad light switch and you just don't mess with it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you've been around longer than I have in terms of hands-on dog training. So these studies that have been, a lot of them that are being cited right now, 2000, um, early 2000s up until 2015. So like 10 to 20 years ago, how would you, like just the knowledge of dog training per se and um, the way we train dogs back then, 10 to 15 years ago, what is, like, how would you describe that? that would validate basically some of these approaches or not. Because what what I'm saying, what I've been criticizing about these studies is that within the last 10, 15 years, our understanding of a lot of technical things, relationship things, dog behavior things have changed dramatically that the setup is not valid anymore for a lot of these experiments. Um, so if you, mm-hmm. you can directly think back of how training was done 10, 15 years, do you see big differences too? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's moving in a good direction altogether. Extremely fast, actually. Um, and the cool thing is that there is this awareness and that quest. Everybody's on the same boat as far as how do we make this interaction right. with the dogs more fun. Again, effective, timely matter and welfare. How do we master this? This is just a, and we keep improving so much to where um, um, I, again, like you're from East Germany, I, I um, but um, again, I, I, I'm talking 80s, I'm talking hardcore communism. We had no idea if this will ever end. I mean, that's yeah. why I, I, I basically escaped because I, I thought that's how it's going to be. It's going to be like yeah. North Korea for the rest of my life. And, mm-hmm. and, but we trained at the time Russian military style. That's how, that's what we knew. Right. Um, when I read like, like one of the what? ultimate examples, and that's the, um, I think it's 2000 and, um, Matthias, um, and Van der Boer. Mm-hmm. It, the, the thing in Holland when they did with the KMPB dogs. I, I have no idea what they were talking about because for a dog to be a, afraid to go on the field, to be always twitchy and avoiding the person that works and feeds them and walks them, and to act like this even in a, a, other parks or streets, because of what they are doing in training, I cannot imagine what the hell that possibly can be. But you cannot call that training, and I can guarantee you that nobody today will accept what, if that was even a thing. I just cannot imagine it. Yeah. Same thing with when we talk about the the learn helplessness experiments. You know, like for those dogs, it took a, a serious level of abuse i mean they were shitting themselves and i mean it, like like i i kind of have some insights on these experiments these are this is not like level 10 on an electric collar we, we are talking animal cruelty to to level that you i probably would not be able to watch it for for five seconds mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, you cannot say that this is what dog trainers do. Right. And there are some people that do shit that is wrong. 
Right. But they, at least when you, when I'm looking on the internet and, and something comes up, very rarely is somebody with electric collar. I mean, they're doing like, like having electric collar or not having electric collar, using whatever, like if you're a bad person, you will be a bad person. Right. And, and you will do horrible things. Right. So why are we focusing on how to ban something versus there is probably some weirdo next to you that's being bad to who knows what animal. Why don't you do something about that person instead of fighting on the internet about uh, uh, how shock callers are whatever? Right. I don't know. I think, well, that's the loophole that we can fall into, a rabbit hole that we can fall into. And it's like a constant conversation. It's not, because everyone says it's not about the tools. And one ba big example you hear and see a lot is look at Germany. We banned e collars mm. and what, like, I've been my hometown, hometown. They don't need e collars to do bad things to the dogs. Right. <laughs> and it is still happening. Just like last right. year, I saw, I mean, like, actually, Malinois. Um, and that's just what where, they know. Where are you? Where, where in Germany? Jena, J-E-N-A. So it's in Thuringia. It's okay. in, right in the middle of, of Germany. Okay. Call okay. size. It's very, Call very size. nice trucking around there. Like endless places oh, yeah? to truck. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, but, but this is really a, a very true, um, it, it, like if you ask the, the, companies that sell electric colors after they got banned they are selling the same number of colors to the countries that are banned like nothing has changed no what has actually changed and this we can argue in many different ways if there is any correlation or no but but they, somebody sent me from switzerland a uh, very interesting data some some newspaper kind of wrote it and how the problems with dogs keeps really going higher and higher and higher and what is the interesting part is that that dramatic kind of takeoff if you want to call it started one year after they banned tools in house in switzerland is it true? Is it not? But I I know firsthand that I have I have two dogs from Switzerland. The one was two year old Malinois female, and they cannot put a prong collar on her to tell her to stop barking and doing dog things. And you know, I'm very happy that I have her because she's a super cool dog and she's one of my breeding dogs and she's not spinning and she's not, she's just very nice all around dog. But nobody, it was like when you, if you follow what the law is, which if you're a Swiss citizen, you most likely will follow the law because it's uh, different consequences. And they send the dog to be trained. Um, what did I say? I, I want to say that they did in Germany, but I'm not sure. But they send it for three months prior to coming to me. I'm like, well, you, you have to kind of see what's happening. I mean, the dog is there three months. And all I'm seeing is this video of the dog walking on a leash. And there is a cat that's just sitting there and the dog is not reacting. And I'm like, this may or may not work. And what are you going to do if it doesn't work? And they're like, no, no, they say it's going to work. Well, they took the dog back. They gave her exactly how to just, just do this, you know, or, or everything, everything but telling the dog, don't do that. Mm -hmm. and, and finally, I got a call. I'm like, oh, yeah, of course, I'm coming to take her. No question. Um, and that happens a lot, I think. Um, and at the same time, you have few people in Switzerland that are allowed to use electric color. Mm -hmm. They have to pass certain tests. Mm -hmm. And then if somebody on the other side of the country has a problem, then they have to go 
to that person and they can work with them. Mm -hmm. But what is that, how good this can be when you take your dog one time somewhere else to work on a problem that you have at home? Right. Like what, what is the point? Right. (laughs) Or, or in Germany right now, you know, the, the latest thing It's like, well, they're forbidden, but the police can use it, but only in deployment, not for training. It's like, they need it in training. They don't need it. Like, who needs it in deployment? Yeah. And just the fact that they are admitting that, that they need it, it demonstrates that they understand that it's not rainbow and unicorns. Like, positive reinforcement, it's not universally the the best thing ever and the only thing it can it can fail and there are other options like we know this like why is it so hard yeah we we, we're tiptoeing around this whole concept of punishment and when we said fear and anyone who even remotely talks about it is immediately like torturing the animals and dogs without the nuances understanding of what actually leads to it. Um, but just to, to switch slightly the topic, because I think mm. it's not just about punishment, but also about reinforcement itself. And I think even in that realm, so many misunderstandings happening, what reinforcement really is, because not only do we then channel everything into reinforcement, but then we also say, well, my dog likes treats and fruit and it feels reinforced. Um, but what is really reinforcement in terms of learning, right? And there's like some something that you can anecdotally pick up. It's like, you know, we have to constantly elevate the value of the treats or the food that we are using because my dog just doesn't like it anymore. It just doesn't work for it anymore. Or as soon as the dog doesn't see the food, it's not working for it. And a lot of other little nuances that really show you the uh, the idea of reinforcement is not just straight up at the right time I give you a piece of food. And your understanding from reinforcement in the context of play makes it even more complicated because then it goes into what's the right play. So, and I want to put this in the context of, to make it even more complicated, I want to put this in the context of um, error-free learning because I really interested in this understanding of reinforcement to increase or promote learning, not just maintaining a certain behavior, but actually push forward learning and how that really happens on a dopamine experience anticipation level. Because unless you violate the the expectation in one way or another, meaning your mm-hmm. reinforcement is stronger than you expect it or lower than you expect it, learning will not happen. And the problem with um, reinforcement or reinforcement only, the very nature of reinforcement is the dog, well, any animal, will always seek higher value and will never stop. By the, the brain will never stop seeking right. higher values. So eventually, as humans, you run into the issue of I can't elevate the value anymore to keep you motivated. So the expectation gap has to come from somewhere else, which might be no reward or even an aversive stimuli because the dog didn't expect it, where then learning can come in. So from a dopamine level and discount, there is no such thing as error-free learning. But the error-free learning, reinforcement, punishment i know this is like a really broad question but in your experience and like handling dogs how this is all fall together into a system where we constantly motivate our dogs to learn what we want them to learn and why is there such a such a strong also aversion against making the dog understand errors right playing with the intensity yeah. of this these are these are i mean it's kind of the you know, Sidman and Skinner's quest of, of you know, uh, we, we can, we can make everything better without the laws that are fundamental on planet Earth. 
We're going to just <laughs> take those out and we're going to create new and and forget what you come genetically baked inside you. We're going right. to like, like totally change that very easy, you know? And we know that that didn't happen. We know it already from way back from Watson with his, I'm going to make the kids whatever I want just to reinforce. We know that didn't happen. We know with uh, uh, John Garcia's experiment with the uh, food aversion that, you know, like it's reinforcement is not the solution always. It, it is, but it's not always. And then when we talk about like all the differential reinforcement programming, which is beautiful stuff, they also have, they, they're not always successful. They're just not. There is this, uh, what was it called? Tony, Tony Nevin or Nevin or something. He had this one, the, call it behavioral momentum, call it momentum from uh, like Newton's from physics, but kind of in a mm-hmm. behavioral terms. And basically, and ba- like in a nutshell, like it's a, okay, yeah, you can be reinforcing some alternate behavior, for example, but the behavior that you don't necessarily like, there is a very big chance that it's lingering there and actually becomes more persistent. It doesn't necessarily has to go crazier, mm-hmm. but it gets, it's not going away simply because something else is being reinforced in that. But when that begins to fade away, this says, I still need the reinforcement. <laughs> right. um, and, and so in reinforcement, you have so many interesting things, but the world doesn't go around on simple reinforcement for behaviors. Right. Like every behavior, there is a, a some emotional attachment to everything you do. And in dog training, we talk like dog trainers love to talk about emotions and, but, but I, I don't think very few understand like the, the really how, how deep this goes. And um, mm-hmm. with, I, I forgot my thought here. You were asking me about reinforcement and I just lost it something. Go, go back well, and help me out. Because well, I had really, something to say. I just totally went off on somewhere else. That happens. Um, in, in the realm of reinforcement, um, what, what I find interesting is if we were to stick to reinforcement only, the way the brain is wired, all of our brains is we ever, we will always seek higher values of it. So we could, um, enjoy our favorite TV show and it's, you know, really enticing. We feel rewarded for right. it. Okay. Um, yeah. I got gotcha. you. I'm back. I'm back. So. So it's not even, I mean, this is one, but, but it's like a whole wagon of, of things. I mean, take novelty, for example. I mean, you can have a freaking steak in front of the dog and there is a leaf that's coming down, like just a dead leaf. Right. And they're like, wow, (laughs) and you got my attention. Wow. Like the, I mean, novelty is insanely like underrated it is um, then yeah the situation of of okay well what are you, give me something else i know you have something else <laughs> or like um the other one that always and and the force free hate me when i bring this up you know the whatever his name is now i'm so bad with the names i don't know uh, the book punished by rewards. Um, Cohen is his last name. I cannot think, of, but but anyway, the one of the things that really, the probably the super cool thing that he said is that reinforcement can actually destroy the motivation of you doing something that you want to do. Like, like, let's say I like to paint and you start rewarding me for painting. 
And now I, I'm in a conflict. I'm like, okay, do I need the reward or do I like painting? Mm -hmm. And you can see how uh, sometimes if you are reinforcing something that it's naturally enjoyable and naturally rewarding and, and you have that talent and desire to do, you don't need a reward. But when the reward is kind of the reinforcer is forced into you for something like that, that could very well be the end of your desire to do it in the way you used to in the past. It shifts your gears, right? Okay, I want to inject here because um, I wonder if that's what, what really happens here, if there's alliance with what you just said. So there is the state of mind. So the, the state a dog is in while doing something. There's a state of motivation. I'm doing something in order to right, in order to achieve something like a reward. And then there's a state of, I like what I'm doing for the sake of what I'm doing without the motivation right. state at it. And there be, these are all reward systems involved, circuits in the brain, but they're overlapping, but they're also slightly different because one keeps you content in the moment. It's like, I like painting for the sake of painting. One switches to a motivational there is an end goal in mind that i have right. and that it's not a contentment state of mind it's a, a working towards something and i think that puts the dog in the very different kind of mindset in terms yes. of what you're doing. yes very much it kind of like again the the whole idea about the flow with that shish kamishvili whatever his her difficult name is you know like everybody says it but but that's kind of what that is like yeah. you can be yeah truly in the moment and oh here is pizza <laughs> jesus christ right yeah. like yeah. you could go three days without eating but because you're in that moment and because you just are totally contained of what you're doing and here is a slice of pizza why not <laughs> but yeah there, i i agree with you the re reinforcement is like there's just so many things about it and and including with play even now you will see, I, I see trainers where it's like, okay, I'm going to teach you how to play fetch and I will be rewarding you with food. Of course you can do it, but you're making the actual playing fetch an obedience exercise and potentially somewhere down the road, the dog can say, oh, I can do that for fun too. Instead of, immediately understanding that this is just a like like dog chasing a ball like what we, why does he need the treat you you're you're derailing the the moment of the beauty of what you're about to accomplish by doing that Let, let's stick here there for a moment because when we talk about why would one want to use a tree to teach chasing a ball Maybe because the dog doesn't seem to have any interest in playing and chasing the ball. So in the in the context of play and playing with your dog, um, as you as you mentioned, you know, with Dr. Sergio Pallas, who has uh, analyzed play, and one of the what I find very interesting um, findings is take two strains, different strains of rats, and one of the rats. Or like they, they have a different kind of intensity of what they like to play. And you put them together and play almost dies completely. They just mm -hmm. can't play with each other. And it's mm -hmm. like this, this, this concept of you're just not on the same page. It's not like I don't want to play. I'm just not on the same page with you. And I think here again with like the whole concept of play and be simplified. Like, oh, it's a dog and should be running after a ball. And that's the play. And this is, yes, I'm playing all the time with my dog. Um, and, and, and like, truth be told, like completely honest here, uh, I don't know how many years ago, seven years ago or so or something, when I started out being more hands-on with all this stuff and I found your stuff on, on YouTube with Fetch and I was like, that's stupid. It's just throwing a ball. What's, what's so complex and what's yeah, the what's big deal that? about Ivan doing this stuff? And then you start realizing like, holy shit, there's actually so many elements to it. 
again, how it, what kind of state of mind the dog is in, how much aversive competition a dog can take within play and being on the same page is so important. So my question really is here, is it on us as like dog owners and handlers to adjust the way we play with our dogs so that the dogs enjoy it? Or is there a middle ground? Because one thing you often hear is, well, my dog is very physical, but I can't have my dog jump up on grandma. Is there a middle ground? Or what is the solution to finding really what the dog's like in terms of play? There, there are differences, of course, in dogs. Just again, then some, some dogs are much more, as, as I said, some dogs would love to do protection sports. Some dogs will be totally happy and contained doing agility. And some dogs will just walk around the block and mark trees and life is as good as it can be. Depending on the age, like any, any dog in an early age, is playful. Even even a very bad, poorly bred dogs, um, as long as something really horrible didn't happen with you know, whatever again, like like for play to to even be possible, most of the other needs have to be reasonably met. Mm-hmm. Otherwise they are priorities. Um and if there is any traumatic experiences you know they will affect and if you cannot do it without using a treat to convince the dog to play then use the treat you know um i i I would rather have you do whatever it takes but create some kind of play for play to happen if like like my point is that if the dog will end up playing because you used full reward to convince them to play. That means that the desire to play was there. Mm-hmm. It, it's just dormant, but it's there. Mm-hmm. And if it's long as it's there, it's way easier to bring it up on its own yeah. instead of creating it as an obedience exercise. And for that to happen, there is a lot of I mean, there's just a lot, just like how we were talking about reinforcement. Like with play, you know, like you have, it's not, okay, it's four o'clock and I feel like I'm going to play with my dog. Well, if the dog doesn't want to play, it's not going to be on your terms. That's for sure. Yeah. Then you have to think, well, what are the dogs? They're still predators. They still eat meat, like it or not. That's who they are. (laughs) They're mostly active dusk and dawn. So pay attention, pick up some of those times, pick up, um, you know, like create, like no, no dog will ever go after a really sick squ- squirrel that's dragging itself to the tree. <laughs> it will just be like, okay, go away. Cause I don't even want to touch you. So when somebody says, oh, I'm really playing and they're like tossing the ball and it's like the dog doesn't even... There is like, what are we doing here? You know, like, you, so there is ways how to entice a dog and how to trigger and how to wake them up to where all these instincts that are sleeping can like within five minutes come out. Mm-hmm. Like I do it every time I go somewhere to to teach people how to play. Um, and... Yeah, that, that 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 was one of the things. Basically, what I'm saying is like if you if you can get a dog to play some way, you would have been able to make it play um, as as play intends to happen. Um, Why do one of the very beautiful things about play is the struggle, the very initial struggle of how are we going to play? Okay, maybe you want to play, but how do we establish some rules, some boundaries, how we cooperate, how we maintain the play, how that play is interesting because there has to be some sort of competition if it's a competitive game. Otherwise, I don't want to play with you. you you're probably not going to want to play with you regardless of if you're the better player or not, like we know the outcome. This is just no point. That struggle is where 
you you really build the the i hate to say these words that's why i'm kind of stopping because mm-hmm. like when you say relationship and engagement it's just yeah, words that know, just like just suck like they just yeah like yeah, they have lost their meaning anymore totally. you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but but during this struggle is that dog understands who I am. They understands am I the patient person? Am I the kind of short fuse type of person? Mm-hmm. And they learn how to deal with me as who I am. I learn how to deal with the dog as who they are, what their home base is. But you find this out through that self-exploration to where we are kind of forced to find a way to agree how we're going to play. And that's the most beautiful part. Everything after that, it's, yeah, now, now we are just playing. Yeah. But this is where we get to know each other. This is where we get to like, I either trust you or I don't. I either respect you as an authority figure or I don't. Yeah. Um, and, and so on and so on and so on. But all, all this happens in the very initial stages of play where it's the struggle of coming to these terms. Yeah. And when you add food there and you get rid of the struggle, you're basically avoiding that interaction, which to me is the most priceless thing. To give my own experience here, it's my relationship, my in- not just with them play my entire relationship with my Malinois Anya, you see there, everything mm-hmm. we do together from like going on walks or working together, like hanging out, everything, the development of, of it, I could distill it in to the development of our play together. So basically our development of our play together is reflected in everything else that we do as a team together. And now looking back, I realized because we struggled a lot. Um, She probably just as much as I did to find the way how we play um, to the point where I like had to like take in so much information, try different things, but we struggled a lot in playing. But then now looking back, we also struggled a lot in everything else to be really Mm -hmm. like understanding each other. Right. And there was a lot of expectations on her that I, um, you know, whether they were fair or not, I don't think it was unfair, but it was just like not on the same page. And it was reflected in how we play together. It was just interesting now to see because we have a very physical play and I enjoy that and I don't mind it, but we, everything else is now smooth as butter, you know? And I, I think it is being reflected in the relationship and also even un, even the pa- part of overcoming misunderstandings that still happen sometimes during play. It's like, oh shit, I thought you're going to come this way, but you came this way and now we kind of bumped into each other. That's awkward. Let's just keep playing though. Even that part kind of is reflected in when we train. It's like, I didn't mean that, but I probably was like saying something that confused you. Let's just get over it and continue. Right. And um, Yeah, very true. That is something that I never thought of it this way, but now as you were mentioning it, it's like looking back, it's like, yeah, the, the history of our play is the history of our entire relationship, basically. Yeah, that's, that, that's kind of how I see play. And again, it's not the, the struggle, the, the early struggle. And uh, anytime I teach somebody, I, I pretty much start with that in mind to mm-hmm. where instead of being the discouraged and disappointed and angry even to kind of embrace it as as the most interesting part it's kind of like you know like any anything that you're learning but play is it's not even anything that you're learning it's just so including what you said i mean including the ability to forgive mm-hmm. okay i you know that wasn't what I meant to do, mm-hmm. and and you both know it. And sometimes mm-hmm. it's like, no, you did that on purpose, <laughs> and that's not cool, you know. Yeah. And yeah. this but... only happens in pair in play, in a healthy way that we can come into agreements and terms without, uh, uh, you know, uh, going going any deeper in in breaking relationship, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and even like. Um, I think there are like some aspects that children do too and play is like testing the waters too. 
right? Like you just said, hey, I knew you did this on purpose and it wasn't cool. And it's like, yes, I did it on purpose as like a dog because I was testing you too. I was like, can right. I push the can I push it a little bit? And the only, even if it's not cool, the only reason why we can come back from it is because it's within the context of it's still playful. And I think that happens just like with, within animals and within the context of play with humans and dogs. Yeah. Too. Yeah. The, very much like we, we, with kids and the dogs and, and like if, uh, again, like if I play what I call the possession game, where it's a competition game between me and you for a toy. I am allowing you, the dog, also to come up with some ideas, mm -hmm. also to put your flavor in the game. I am mm -hmm. not telling you how exactly to play. You experiment with it and see what's going to work for you. Mm -hmm. And then I'll try to counter it. And, and so we are going back to that, allowing that free experience of play, that it's not controlled, that it's you know, self-exploring to where you, even you, you know, a little puppy learns how fast it can grab the toy or how fast it can spin and, and the brain's kind of making these notes. In, and yeah. it's brilliant. It's just really like for me, unfortunately, lately I always talk about electric colors. Yeah. But, <laughs> but um, outside the internet, that's what my passion is. That's yes. what my like... Oh, like it's it's just like an obsession play yeah why do um, the why do adult dogs continue to play and i asked this dr sergio palace too in terms of his rats um mm -hmm. and for him like there's a reason why adult rats play and there's a reason why adolescent and pup rats play and it's different in terms of the the goal of it Right. Do you see any difference in dogs? And it's also different, you know, like like we can certainly take a lot from rats or, or other animals, but dogs, not because we like them, but they are special. They're unique in, in some ways. And, and one of the ways is that they will play with objects. Like two dogs will pick a, a stick and chase each other for it. They don't need a human necessarily. Rats wouldn't never, that's just not in their repertoire of what play is. It's more mostly, uh, what do you call it? The rough and tumble kind right. of style, like the play right. aggression, right? Yeah. Um, to where dogs that are healthy and that their needs are met and everything, they remain playful it fades away. Like I have, again, growing up in Bulgaria, um, and I lived some part of my life also in, in like uh, Africa. I, I even now, anytime I go back to Bulgaria, I spend a great deal of time with the stray dogs or up in the mountains with the guard dogs, with the sheep. Um, so I, I've been around dogs that are you know they, they have contacts with people but they're definitely not interacting in the same way as our dogs will as they get older these dogs are not as playful that's for sure but mm -hmm. they have other they, they're it's important for them to constantly navigate okay well when is the trash gonna get picked up what else oh, there's that person <laughs> that doesn't like me i need to like their concerns they're again like all the needs are not met so as you're getting older i think and being a dog that you're straight you have uh, uh priorities Busy. Um, <laughs> right but at the same time if a little puppy approaches you it doesn't matter if you're male or a female even if you're the grumpiest dog if it's one puppy now if it's the whole gang coming yeah <laughs> that's a bad idea to everybody get out but if one puppy kind of comes cute and play bells, it will entice the dog that is nine years old for a little bit to give him something, you know? <laughs> um, but why they play, like my theory, <laughs> this is like really one of my big speculations of how humans and dogs came together. It could have been the food, but eventually maybe the human decided to throw a bone and the dog for whatever reason brought it back instead of eating it. 
Like I, I am very much convinced without any proof <laughs> that <laughs> that play had some role into it because it's such a fundamental way to interact and both humans and dogs are really on another level of of how we take play how seriously we take play yeah and and it's not like again we can say well they've been living with us for so many years and so uh, and from a puppy you start playing it's innate just like with us um i don't think i have a, a good answer why they play but i yeah. know that that that's the reason why we are so hooked on each other. Like yeah. I'm convinced that that has a lot to do. Yeah. A lot of things, well, some intentions from dogs coming there that we don't even understand yet. I mean, just like go with the ride, you know, we just ride this wave of we're playing and we love it. And we, that's why we have dogs and it just works. It kind of just, you know, we, the evolution just works together that way. Right. It sucks for me one, like a, uh, staying with play you know like mm. again thinking of getting a puppy and you want to do the right things and typically what is the right thing <laughs> it's very hard to say what is the right thing it's like okay well do i walk the puppy out to see the world or not until the vaccines are all done do I socialize? And what is socialization? Do I want to take him to the elevator and to Lowe's, to hardware store, whatever? And if I have to pick one thing, that would be play. And not necessarily with me, but play with your own species first and foremost. And not just with one play buddy, because that's a, a very... Uh, um, kind of narrow-minded even if you want. Like there is, you cannot reap the benefits of, no, who are you? And how do we figure it out how to play? That's the that's the beauty of the play. So to me, having a young dog is putting it to play. And, and you have to, this is another thing. I, I was just talking with somebody. No, actually it was a Zoom call with my class. Um, there, there was a question about daycare and stuff and we ended up talking about it. But in, uh, very often people will see do two dogs play, right? And it's like, okay, yeah, they're playing. It's like, no, that dog's having a blast and this dog is just trying to kind of survive. And if he had a choice, mm -hmm. he would be gone, but he has no choice. So he has to kind of fake play, but he's not happy. He don't want to play. Right, right, right. right. And you want to, like, so with that puppy, you want to be selective you don't want to that puppy always be the bully you don't want you want to give them variation to where they self-explore and self-control and get into that little scruffle see how they get out of it and sometimes they get out of it that way sometimes they get out of a different way and then they have to come back and learn how to come back at each other in a good way these are invaluable skills versus well, let's take them to PetSmart, walk around, and people give them treats. That's cool, but that's not what's about to me. Yeah. I think that, that it reminds me of, um, and it goes to the back a little bit about also curiosity, right? Fostering curiosity and fostering risk-taking um, in this, in this, some of these experiments with rats um, in, in some of the ongoing studies that he has is if a rat has, a young rat has the option of multiple playmates, but knows one of them. Uh, yeah, I listened to that one. Yes. Yeah. 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 Isn't that, that was very good. Yes. Like they yes. will go through all of them and then maybe go back to the original one, but there is a chance that you might play better with someone else. And that sounds so simple, but what actually what goes in, there's also a chance that you really get into a fight and have a bad experience with someone else. So that mindset of I'm taking that risk because I'm curious about the exploration and might benefit from it or not also is like, you know, kind of this overcoming of adversity and overcoming. Yeah, of 100%. Yes, I remember yeah. him talking about this with you. Yes, very much. I mean, that goes back to what we were just saying about uh, 
the leaf coming down. It's like, oh, the leaf. It's like, of course, right. this, the, the curiosity and the novelty. Right. And like me going to play with some somebody or going in a gym to to fight, you know, martial arts. Like, it's very different if it's my body that it's always, it's like, but now you feel energized and you feel like, okay, I am now to kind of test myself again. And it's not a, and it's a play. So I am testing myself in so many ways. And one is, okay, who I am against you, but also how I come out after if I lose, how I come out. If I win, how I come out. And how we decide, do we maintain, do we cooperate and go on, or do we walk away? And even if we decide to walk away, that's also a skill, right? right. right. To, to say, okay, I'm in some way, I'm going to say, yeah, that's good, but I want to walk away. Yeah. And learning even that, that's so, like, when, when a dog knows how to do that, that's like the, you know, the, the person that owns the room anytime they walk in, regardless what room is and regardless of what we are talking, they, they know how to navigate it because they read the room, like, like right. oh, I'm able to understand two dogs, not just one, right? Two dogs understanding how to solve a conflict or solve a, get it, find to a solution or have fun together, right? In, the, in that sense. I have one one other big topic, which is um, goes probably hand in hand, but the arousal, the the role of arousal um, in dogs and training and and being a dog, and potentially even like where we're going, where we're headed towards in today's society, also just like with our own arousal as humans, like don't be too upset, don't be too excited, stay calm, you know, get fired, don't be mad, just go for a walk, like this kind of idea of like keeping the homeostasis of staying calm and what it does to the arousal that's probably much more important to dogs in, in, in general. Yeah. And uh, um, whenever I bring up um, and my content is arousal is good and you know you can you have a dog in the right better mindset to learn um, the feedback is obviously split but on one hand is like yes and the other hand is like the dog and the high arousal is horrible, can, can learn. Unmanageable. Right. Unmanageable, cannot be controlled. So what are we misunderstanding about arousal? I, I love higher levels of arousal. <laughs> um, but you have to, you have to appreciate it and you have to, um, like I will give you an example with protection sports. Like there is still even even with all the dogs that like to do protection, some dogs really go insane. And trying to make them stay in a lower state of mind works for very little. And they don't want to be there. They always will continue to seek to how like even even with the they will find an excuse oh you gave me a green light i'm i'm right here 100 percent, 200 percent in so but there is um i think managing that is not difficult it's just a matter of of understanding how to raise criteria and what are the priorities at different stages um like one of the classic things is, well, don't reward that dog with a toy because it's just going to go off the roof of the charts and you, you're not manageable and they cannot even, they cannot even hear you, forget about actually doing something. Um, so use food. And of course, food is manageable because you have absolute control. The problem though with the toy is that you decide to use toy without establishing that cooperation with that basically skipping all that part that we just mm -hmm. talked about mm -hmm. and saying oh we're gonna it is just here mm -hmm. is a ball on a rope let's go and the dog is like okay i go 
and then you're trying to make the dog out and ask for a different behavior and now it starts to just go more and more downhill and everybody gets frustrated and now that arousal that had actually very good healthy intentions turns into a very negative state on both ends um but th- there is many ways to to work with it yeah i don't think it's a really an issue mm-hmm. if we're talking about a dog that has some behavior problem like let's say whatever even leash reactivity is kind of like relationship and engagement i don't know what it means but let's say you're walking with the dog and it just goes off on some other dog i'm gonna eat you all and unless you've done some work prior to addressing this in that higher house of my step, you will most likely not going to be very productive. Mm-hmm. Um, which, again, goes back to playing, coming to agreements, concepts, you know, like I am very big on concepts to where it's like, okay, we, there is a problem here. Let's just kind of peel that onion a little bit further down to something that I can work with. And I can show you how that can translate there. Mm-hmm. So so when we are talking about behavior problems, I wouldn't like to deal with them in a high arousal state. I would go somewhere and then come back when we have understanding and, and they have something to rely to, kind of like... You know, like, I mean, you, you, you know, with your background in science, like concepts and categories. And, you know, when we talk about a bird and pigeon, you know, it's a bird, and, but so is in penguin, even though it's hardly resemble the same. But when you understand them or you look at a chair and a chair and a chair, and then it's like, who knows how many different kind of chairs and you don't need to see every single one to know that it's a chair. But so the same thing is with the arousal. Like if you, if you have a, if you have done your homework, arousal is a beautiful thing. But if you try to do something with that arousal, just straight on and you don't have skill. And even sometimes if you do have skill, I think it's a, yeah. Uh, not not the right way to do it. But so, I love it to have it. <laughs> well, the, the the problem that really comes up a lot is that, like people bring home these these dogs that have a tendency to like how higher arousal. They just like to be in this adrenaline state. Um and then there's this conflict between I want you to be calm, but at the same time I want you to learn. And I think for a lot of dogs that are liking the arousal are also in a better state of learning when they're just a little bit elevated, right? Like this is something we know since the 70s that cognition and memory in terms of arousal activation follows this inverted U shape. There's a peak and like this moderate arousal and there's, you know, not good for learning when it's very low or when it's very high. Correct. And when we work with that peak state, like often the skill that's missing, what we what we convey in public and on social media is your skill that's missing is you need to do more relaxation protocols and try to calm your dog and feed in place and do a downstay and all these things. Because otherwise your dog is running in zoomies. But is it not just is it not running in zoomies and then turning it into a downstay, but more so taking that energy and add focus to it to something you can c- control? but still kind of provide an outlet for some of the energy that is there to teach better behaviors. So the focus part of it, like the relationship between arousal and focus that you have control over as a handler, I think doesn't click for a lot of people because they don't see that this is actually a matter of focus and not so much arousal. Do do you agree with that? Yeah, 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 definitely. I just had to bite my lips when you started talking about relaxation protocols and, and stuff like that because it's just a 
such a wrong take, you know. It's, it's very much the same as with the psychotropic medications. Um, like I, I had another podcast yesterday, and um, um, I went to my cabinet with the medicine, dog medicine stuff, and I pull out, I think five or six bottles of floxetin and all, all the good stuff, you know. And different names, different dogs, different ages, like from, from seven months old, like simply because you're not allowing the dog to, to be a dog. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it's very sad. Um, you have, you know, like a dog that is that type of dog and you start working on calmness and relaxation protocols and, and all this stuff. And, and this is basically, a, a, you know, like a person that, you know, he's more of a thrill seeker, like a, they, and you're trying to change their nature. And that leads to, in my opinion, this is a lot of times where the problems come with, with uh, dogs, uh, where, you know, when there is this, repetitive routine it's like okay we're going around the block we're doing this and there is a little activity and there is this and whatever but the dog doesn't really get the stimulation and the interaction that they're born to to they, they it's a need yeah. and when you don't give it they find they're seeking and they find it and now it's the wrong choice and now we have a behavioral problem right and now we decided, okay, my, we have to do, you know, we put it on a floxetin, a little bit of trust on, and um, we manage the dosage. And next thing you know, the dog is all for four years on, on something uh, for not allowing them to basically be who they are. I think it's a, it's a universal problem. And, and when you talk about relaxation, like, do you know the, have you come across uh, Karen Overall's mm -hmm. relaxation protocol? Yes, I have. It's, it's, it's really, like, it's amazing how people buy this kind of thing. It's really a very intelligent way of teaching a downstay without the dog, without the person understanding that they're teaching downstay. Mm -hmm. And you're calling it a relaxation protocol. Mm -hmm. Relaxation is when the dog says, you know what? I need to lay down and I need to recharge. I, I need to relax. But unless the dog actually needs to relax, you cannot, like, you can, you can make him, okay, yes, I, I'm laying down. But it, yeah, I know what you're getting at. It's this artificial, like, decision making for a dog to relax which is kind of like telling an upset person you need to relax it doesn't right. work that right. way right right what does it's work kind of like like you know when yeah. i decide that i have enough and i go to my room just as soon as i open the door it's a change of of how i think how I feel, it's, it's a, I check out. This is totally uh, uh, very easily done with a dog. This kind yeah. of associations are super easy to be done. But to convince a dog to do a downstay and to call it a relaxation, yeah, it, it, it's just in so wrong in so many levels. As a society, I think going, going down a wrong path, Instead of appreciating and working with the arousal, we're just trying more and more and harder. And we're losing ourselves in ridiculous, sometimes ridiculous suggestions um, that just don't make sense anymore. We don't see it because it's being supported by a lot of really random things that we do for ourselves, but also for, for our dogs. And like a dog that then snaps for no reason at something that has never happened before, like a, I don't blame them because they're constantly held in like some sort of some sort of arousal prison. Yes, yes, that's exactly. That's kind of like what you call it, like this uh, kind of boredom susceptibility. You know, it's like you are, and 
they're trying to take away any little excitement that probably can you can at least go along with mm-hmm. until you you blow up and and explode on something totally inappropriate like i i always say there there is always room for psychotropic meds but in all my experience i have not yet seen the dog that needed it mm-hmm. and i'm still not rejecting that there is a dog that really just i i can theoretically see how a dog can be so tormented that we need to make its life easier in that way somebody listening to me talking right now would immediately say yeah there is ivan punishment based trainer disregarding all the what science says and the modern evolution of dog training and and that's like i don't know how we find this way that we can talk about these things without immediately going like oh yeah you you're neanderthal you're like in the middle the medieval ages like you're just stuck and you don't know better and that's why you probably had a really horrible childhood and and all you're thinking is about shocking the dogs and and they are sentient beings and we care about them and you know and and i don't see how when I disagree with a lot of the nonsense, immediately has to go so far on the other yeah. side, but it does every single time. Yeah. When you hear that, like you, got, you probably have heard this many times, when you do, does this affect you or have you grown kind of like, yeah, whatever to it? Um, sometimes. Sometimes it does, um, not personally. I mean, of course, not personally. I know who I am. I know who, what I stand for. I mean, uh, typically those people, they, they just, it's a, just a classic straw man arguments and, mm-hmm. and they just have no, no idea of, of who somebody is. And, but yeah, you don't know that I send money to, few different organizations to save dogs you don't know that i have people coming here with dogs that are to be put down like you you don't know that i have two rescue dogs that live with me even though i breed malinois you 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 don't know nothing about me but you are very very eager to just box you type on that keyboard you know Mm -hmm. and so, like the short answer is, I I, I don't think I get uh, affected simply because I I know who I am and I know what I do, and I know that I do um, uh, very good things, including including teaching dog trainers how yeah. to be effective, how to train ethically, and how to do it in a timely manner. You know. But these um, these things kind of, especially in the within within social media being very really flat in, in terms of the discussion that can be held. And yet they became the main platform for these kind of con- uh, discussions. And I think what's getting lost is critical thinking about right. things, just things. And as an, like, I'll give you an example, just like by me reviewing um, scientific papers, the critical th- the lack of critical thinking is, is really concerning to me because it makes me wonder, it's like, this is the society we live in. Is the society we're living in. I don't think yet, like a sit down and really talking about this with, with people that we have different point of view. I don't think this is in the near future possible. I don't think regulations are in the near future possible the way that i want to see this happening hopefully see change even even if it's slow but even though i ruffle a lot of feathers um with my series on um it also caught the attention from the right people and i think there's momentum right now i don't know if it's just me kind of like being more exposed than ever 
to this, but I think there is some some momentum that I that can see in here between the lines that I hope lead into the right direction. No, thank you. Thank you for it was super cool conversation. Um I actually have some things to think of. Thank you.